Let us pray before we consider the message of Advent. Lord, this is such an important and striking day for us. It is the summons to spiritual alertness, to rise from any languor or prolonged resting in things as they are and the way the world appears to us and our part in it, to realize that beyond time there is eternity and in time there are decisions and crises that we must encounter which will influence our condition in eternity. So Lord, impress us with this great fact of the shortness of life, the reality of death, and the infinitude, the immeasurableness of eternity before us. Whether we shall live with you in blessedness or be separated from you forever. So Lord, marshal our thoughts and help us to concentrate upon this reality and in your mercy to find ourselves due for the enjoyment of eternal life with you forever and ever, world without end. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're small, but we're still three times the size of a genuine congregation, two or three. And what matters is the Lord's presence among us, his spirit binding us together in worship and mutual love and adoration of the Lord, his spirit giving us an insight into the word as it is focused upon, and his spirit moving us to prayer in seeking those things that are right for us to enjoy at God's hand. Blessings in this life and infinite blessing beyond. So I shall pray while we consider something of the Advent message on this first Sunday of the season. Our Lord, we delight in the message of Advent. It contains three marvelous and vital elements. The promise of your coming, the actual event of your coming to us in the incarnation, your entrance into our lives indwelling us. And then, O oh Lord, the prospect of your coming again, a certainty, but we do not know the hour. And therefore, every hour, we must be on the alert for your appearing. Lord, stir us up to, absor to absorb all these truths in a very vital and a very real way that we may not slumber throughout our lives and forget what is definitely ahead, our encounter with you, the reality of blessing or judgment, the enjoyment of everlasting life or the regret of being separated from you. Lord, speak to our hearts effectually as we ponder these things, in Jesus' name and with his aid. Amen. I think our collect is worth considering for a while this morning. It's very much based on the passage that um, Jason read to us from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's a collect that we shall use along with the daily collect throughout 
the season of Advent. And it's always one of my regrets that Advent is such a brief season. It's overlooked now so much, certainly in the contemporary world, but even in the church of our time, as people hasten on to the celebration of Christmas, I think prematurely, because we need to know what precedes the incarnation. And we ought to note the careful and diligent preparation of the Lord in the sending of his Son. It just doesn't happen in a flash. The Bible is developmental. It develops, it, it is filled with episodes, with a series of events that cause us to anticipate the coming of the Messiah, that great figure intimated to us throughout the pages of the Old Testament, now identified as Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the world's Redeemer, Jesus our Saviour and friend and elder brother, Jesus our goal, when all shall be lit up by the glory of Christ in the dominion of light and all darkness, the darkness of this world and of our hearts will be dispelled. So let us just consider something of the line of thought contained in the collect. We address God as he is and as we should know him, love him, yes, and fear him. Omnipotent power. How good it is that he is also compassionate, that all his attributes are beautifully balanced and coordinated. If God were just brute power, as so many of the ancient gods of the pagans were, we would live a life of terror. He is a God of infinite power, of omnipotence, but that power is always employed wisely and justly. It is a beautiful power that we can fear because of its immensity, but can love and adore because of its goodness and the benefits that it bestows. Almighty God. If we really believe that, much of the error and heresy and sinfulness of the church would not be present with us. We are to admire God in his majesty and supremacy and sovereignty. Almighty God. That should stop all blasphemous talk concerning our religion. It should dispel all casualness in our approach to God. It should inspire diligence and alertness in his service and our walk with him. And then it refers to our predicament as a race that has rebelled against God, born perfect, yet susceptible to temptation. And so our first parents yielded to temptation and through inheritance and our link with Adam, we participate in the darkness and sinfulness and insecurity that his breach with God brought upon our world and our race. So we need divine enabling to commence that return to God. We are far away from him. Now, if things are to be right and we are to be restored to our maker, he must bestow grace upon us. And even to know that that is our need is an evidence of grace. Give us grace to cast away the deeds of darkness. When Jesus came, the darkness resisted him. John says it knew him not. It really means that it could not overcome the light. It could not quench the light. 
The light was too strong for darkness, even at his birth, that wanted to nullify the arrival of the Son of God. We know that through uh, Herod's persecutory plan to kill all the babes in uh, Bethlehem. Jesus was the target of the evil one from the outset. Give us grace to cast away the deeds of darkness. I think as we mature in life and become more analytical about the ways of the world and the conditions in which we live and human nature and its um, its obsessions and its goals, we see just how dark the world is at every level of human society, in every enterprise that humanity uh, tries to pursue, there is such an obvious presence of evil. Government, commerce, politics, international relations, administration in countries and communities, business, ordinary relationships day by day, they are all polluted by human sin, by envy, by self-promotion, by putting self first, by yielding to the temptations and as it were, the demands of the evil one who holds us in his thrall. We are in darkness, and our deeds prove it. And Paul says, and it's used now as a quotation in our collect, put on the armour of light. Put on the armour of righteousness. In Ephesians, Paul tells us, what these various pieces of the armour happen to be. But it's the armour of light because it is the armour of divine righteousness and truth that helps us to see and act aright in accordance with the will of God. We're reminded that this life is mortal. It is transient. It is due for an end, every one of us will one day pass from this world to the next. It's inevitable. A friend and I were both struck by the death of Stephen Sondheim, that great Broadway uh, writer of lyrics and scripts for musicals. And I saw, as a reference to his death on the news, his receiving of his award, the highest award this country can bestow by President Obama. And I saw this man who died at the age of 91, so he was in his mid 80s when the award was bestowed. That smile of absolute and attractive pleasure that was his to be recognized in that way. And at the same time, it came as a flash. What are the honours and the achievements of this world compared to the reality of eternity? How trite they are, especially when we acknowledge the fact of death, when these honours are no, no longer enjoyed by the recipient and quickly forgotten by observers. Ecclesiastes is right to say that all is vanity, all is illusion, and we only encounter reality through the light of Christ when he bids us to himself and renews us by his spirit and gives us at last a discernment and an understanding that is in line with reality. this mortal life. But here's the great message that we're preparing to mark and to celebrate at the festival of the incarnation. Your son, God's only and dear son, the second person of the Trinity, 
the Prince of Heaven, the Ruler of all, the truly worthy one. All his excellencies cause him to shine with splendor. This one came into our world, even entering our world as one of us, his humility. But look what he endured throughout his life and finally his cruel death and burial. He was vindicated by the resurrection, but no one has ever exemplified humility like the high priest of heaven. It's astonishing, isn't it? We all like to be big in our own estimation. We like inevitably to be at the centre of things. We like everything to go our way. And that is a usurping of the sovereignty and throne of God. And in spite of that very brash behaviour that we evince continually in our lives and attitudes, the Son of God came again in incredible humbleness to redeem us to himself and to the Father. So with our mortal life, which we're currently experiencing, and that our inevitable demise, which is ahead of each one of us, we know not when and by what means. We, through faith in Christ, do not fear, but look forward to that last day. We buy a calendar at the beginning of each year. We see the 12 months in front of us, each with their own allocation of days. And we tend to think, yes, we shall experience those dates. We don't know. We have no idea what allocation of time there is for any one of us. And the last day will come, and we have no timetable from which we can work out when that will occur. But our great joy as Christians is that when that last day finally appears, Christ shall come again in his glorious majesty that will cause the world in its shock and the abruptness of his arrival to suddenly see the Saviour who came among us as a poor wandering preacher, to suddenly see that he is of infinite and glorious and shining splendour that the angels of heaven bow before and that all the redeemed will admire the splendour of the Son of God will cause many tears and bitter cries to think that we as a race rejected him, to think that we so ill-treated him and blasphemed him and insulted him and then finally murdered him, there will be deep tears and cries of horror and also shrill screeches of regret that we did not turn to him in due time when opportunity was present. He will come in majesty. This is what always amazes me. When you envisage Christ nailed to the cross, his arms outstretched, his bidding to all who know that he died for the sins of the world, his summons to come to him, and now he comes as judge. The day of mercy has ceased. The day of reckoning has come. The books will be opened. Our conscience will be as clear and accurate as it could possibly be as we look at our lives past and the enmity and rebellion against this great personage, the Lord Jesus Christ, who deigned to come among us to work out our salvation and proffer that blessing to us, and we repudiated it. That shall be an awful day, an awful day indeed for so many. And Paul is saying, ensure, please ensure 
that you are prepared for it through faith and repentance and confidence in the Redeemer. He will come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, every human soul that ever existed. Can you imagine the tenderness and compassion of the Redeemer exhibited on Calvary's tree and then look at the judge, the great white throne, and see that this is the one who shall separate the sheep from the goats, who shall award eternal destinies, blessedness and bliss with God or abandonment by God and that horrible sense of all opportunity lost. I was made in the image of God to reflect his nature. Blood was shed sufficient to purchase me back to God and I refused it. Christ as judge. You see, we have in Scripture what was called and often recognised at different phases in the history of the church, different aspects of the Lord Jesus, the sweet Jesus, who dearly loved the sinful, mingled with them, befriended them and restored them, or the conquering Jesus, leading his armies against the forces of darkness and conquering the evil one and banishing evil and darkness forever and banishing the evil one to the great abyss. Christ the sweet Christ, Christ the conqueror, we alternate between these two perspectives upon him. He will come to judge the living and the dead, but the believer will rise to the life immortal. There's a debate as to whether our souls are mortal or immortal. I believe that they are mortal. I believe that in our fall, our souls lost that, if I can call it a capacity, uh, to live forever. We are raised again to immortality. If we know Christ and are regenerated by him, we have immortality. If the evil who do not know him are raised again, it is to immortality of a most dreadful kind. We are warned against it. The compassion of God sends out this invitation to salvation in his Son to judge the living and the dead so that we may rise to the life immortal. How? Through him who lives and reigns. Christ lives. He is omnipresent. He is in control of all things. He is the executor now of divine providence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rule over time and all motion. Our history is under the hand of God. The conclusion of our history will be summed up by the righteous judgment of God. And the hand of the crucified will direct those who believe to the right side of the throne and those who oppose the Christ to the left side of the throne. That is the sovereignty of God. And now for some closing thoughts. And as I say, this is just an off-the-cuff meditation. To look at the scriptures which are the basis of our collect and to look at the scriptures which are the very word of the Lord on the matter of the quality of our life, righteous or dark and sinful, the quality of our end, favour with God or strong disapproval. Although I agree with Spurgeon's sentiment, and it may just be sentiment, but when God looks into the life of those who are refused, the eyes of those who are refused entrance to the kingdom, he emits a tear. Why? Why did you not listen to me? Why did you not grasp rescue when it was extended to you? 
Why have you missed every opportunity of being restored to me and reconciled to me? So very quickly, to sum up something of the Advent message, a delightful message, but a message also of alarm. I always used to think that every watch and clockmaker's home in Switzerland or to set all the alarms of all their timepieces, small and large, to ring loud early in the morning on the first Sunday of Advent, to stir everyone to an awareness of reality, the one from whom we have received life, the one to whom we are responsible, the one who will demand an account of ourselves, the one who will assess us at the end. And the only reason we shall pass through that assessment is because we will be those who will be clothed and covered by the righteousness of Christ wrought on our behalf by the Lord Jesus. We shall be, through trust in him, deemed as pure and virtuous as he is. Nothing to do with our own worth or potential, but due to our standing in Christ. And do this understanding the present time. You think of Paul writing to Rome. You only have to read a few books on Roman history or watch a couple of documentaries to know how foul and vile Roman culture was. How superstitious and ugly and cruel Roman religion was. I have no admiration of Rome. Marvellous on the outside, its architecture, its art, its culture, but deeply corrupt on the inside, deeply corrupt, horrifyingly so. I have no regard for Rome except sorrow and a desire to look in another direction. If you read the lives of the Caesars, Livy's 12 lives of the Caesars, and see what their personal and domestic lives were like. So here we are in this present time, Paul's present time. Well, I guess we're very much living in a time that matches it for its evil and wickedness and depravity. One is frightened to see the covers lifted in our society as to what is really going on in terms of morality, injustice, greed, envy, and that hatred between one human being and another. The time has come for you to wake up from your slumber, says Paul. Yes, we need rest. We need rex relaxation. We need to be refreshed and replenished. Paul's not against that kind of taking stock of things and recuperating. But it is possible that people are so entranced by this world, entranced by its busyness, its distractions, what it offers in terms of entertainment and gratification and reward, what it offers in terms of distinction and so-called superiority. It's all, all a deceit, all hollow, all so temporary. To wake up from that slumber. I know what it's like that you grow up in a world as childhood and you think everything is just as it should be. You respect the restraints and the objectives of human life. This is what life is all about. And then you get to a point where you realize it's not as charming and enjoyable as you might have thought. Your ideals are not realized in ordinary daily life. You may have a very idealistic idea of the world and the way that you are going to behave within it. But the reality of sin and evil destroys that illusion. And you realize that it's possible just to snooze our way through life, accepting things as they are, without discernment and making judgments, and as it were, exercising right and holy 
decisions. The hour has come for you to wake up. Because our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. There's the refreshment and the um, relief of the gospel. We who feel the weight and the burden of life here, who know its hazards and dangers, and of course, wrestling with our own indwelling sin and imperfections, we can say my salvation, which I've grasped already as an inheritance, that will become my own real possession when the Savior returns again. I will be fully the proprietor of my own inheritance. I won't be looking forward anymore. I will be enjoying in the everlasting present the blessings that God has stored up for me as one of his children. The night is nearly over. The darkness will be dispelled. Here it is to keep us on the alert and looking forward with joy and anticipation. The day is almost here. Almost here. We remember all the parables that are telling us that the kingdom of heaven in its manifestation is very near. Its fulfillment, it's very near. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus first preaching, John the Baptist's first preaching. It's of vital importance. So let us put aside all the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, the armor of righteousness and truth as a protection against the hazards in this wicked world. Let us behave decently, that is with decorum and righteousness and holiness, reflecting the nature and character of God as it is revealed humanly in the Lord Jesus Christ to take on Christ, to clothe ourselves in his likeness, in his attitudes, to be aware of his mind, to enjoy his constant companionship, to be endued with his righteous spirit and nature and godly behavior. Put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently. And these next two lines I can hardly read. They are so gross to, as it were, depict to our imaginations, but I'll read them because they're in Scripture. But any hint of these things is nauseating, absolutely nauseating, especially when you know the prevalence of these things among our elite. Yes. Oh yes, they're there at every level of society. But let us behave decently as in the daytime when things are evident, not in orgies and drunkenness, for which Rome was notorious, for which America is notorious, for which Britain is notorious. I remember the invitations extended at high school. Lord, have mercy. Sexual immorality and debauchery. Is there any... any judgment upon any society or any way of behaviour that could be more horribly described against all natural justness and morality. I'll let you into a secret. I think of those who get involved in these things and you know the current news about certain well-known people. How can people have children and nurture them? How can they look at the beauty of God's creation how can they enjoy all the blessings of this life and indulge in this? <sighs> I 
We know human tendencies and inclinations, and if we're not entrapped by things as evil as this, we can all be caught up in moods and movements of dissension and of jealousy. So Paul says, looking at this very grim picture, it's going to come to an end. There is a bright day on the way, the shining beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ taking his people to enjoy the kingdom of perpetual light and blessedness and holiness in the absolute vision of God in his glory. And so he says, turn away from these things, any hint of them. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. The idea is that somebody is rising for an active day and perhaps still in military terms, and they're putting on their armor, their fighting gear, because that is what the Christian life is, not a compromise with the world, but really an awareness of attack or ambush at any moment, of clashing with the evil one who hates our souls and would cause them to perish. Yes, it is a battle. So when you rise, put on your battle gear, and your battle gear can be summed up as the righteousness of Christ, Christ himself, his nature granted to us, his protection, his truth, his fellowship, his people, as it were, the environment in which we live, the costume of our existence, Jesus Christ, his nature, his influence, his indwelling. Yes, that nearness to Christ, that participation in Christ. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And again, all of these desires are thrust before us through an ungodly media. I'm not being extreme and saying we shouldn't have things that genuinely inform or even entertain. But the media is so very dangerous and subtle in its intent to pollute human life and to drag it down and to put before our view such disgusting interpretations of human life and human nature. We should stop there, not as it were, dreading the darkness, it's been defeated. Not as it were, fearing the world, avoiding it in its terrible in its terrible appearance and inducement to sinfulness, but knowing that our Lord has conquered it all, that he is at work in our lives, that he has pledged his protection of us, that he will see us at last to the kingdom of light safely. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us a hatred of all evil, its subtlety, its seduction its knowledge of our weakest parts and spots, the conflict that is caused by fighting against the kingdom of darkness. Lord, arm us for the fight. Be our armor. Be our stay, be our defender. May we not stand in the battlefield on our own, with you fighting beside us and forging the way ahead through the enemy camp, we know that victory is assured. Patience is required. Trust should be our inclination. Trust in your overcoming power and the reality of your promises 
that can never, ever be rescinded or reversed. Lord Jesus, give us hearts of joy this Advent tide and such a happy recognition of the incarnation as it is celebrated in what we call Christmas. Lord, be with us today. Be very near to us. Take us into your care and protection. And what we so desire for ourselves, we desire for all whom we love in family, friendship and faith. Lord, have mercy, we pray, in Jesus' great name. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, each one, and upon all whom you love, this Adventide and evermore. Amen.